three. Zen, or the skill to catch a killer. We start off today's episode at the Horn family dinner table. We see that Johnny wears his Native American headdress even at the dinner table. Well, the dinner is rudely interrupted by Uncle Jerry, Benjamin Horn's brother. Uncle Jerry's back. He's got baguettes in his hand, and he's on about the best sandwich he's ever had. It's a baguette with brie and butter. He shares some with his brother, and Ben loves it. He is stuffing his face with this baguette. And Sylvia, she just looks ashamed to be there. Sylvia. Benjamin! They even talk to each other with their mouths full. Ew. <laughs> well, the boys go out to the hallway to discuss business. Benjamin tells Jerry, Leland's daughter was murdered and the Norwegians left. Jerry's like, huh, well now I'm depressed. Well, to cheer him up, Benjamin says, there's a new girl at One-Eyed Jack's, and you have a 50-50 chance of getting first dibs. Jerry likes this information. Ben and Jerry are on a boat together, and they arrive at a dock with some lingerie girls greeting them. They enter One-Eyed Jack's, the casino and gentlemen's club. Well, all the lingerie ladies get in formation, and they're like in a V formation, and Blackie emerges from the center. Blackie seems to be like the house mom. You know, she wears all black, she's got black curly hair, pointy shoulder pads, and she runs this place. She's in charge of all the girls. The girls are dressed up like sexified versions of the cards from Alice in Wonderland. So Ben and Jerry toss that coin to see who gets first dibs at the new girl. Well, Ben the boss wins, so he goes off with the new girl. James and Donna are now having a heart-to-heart -heart after dinner. They're sitting by the fire together. He recalls a time before Laura died, whenever Donna and James' eyes met. He says that he almost told Donna that he loved her in that moment. I almost told you I loved you then. They make out, and she's like, oh, James. Cooper is in his hotel room when he gets a call from Hawk. <laughs> Hawk tells him that there was a one-armed man snooping around in tents of care. How curious. Then Cooper gets a knock at the door. He answers, but nobody's there. Instead of finding a person at the door, he finds a note. Written on it is Jack with one eye. Mike and Bobby go off at night into the woods. Under a stump, they find a deflated football and a bag of drugs. Jump scare! Leo's there. He's won his money. This is actually a really fucking creepy scene to me because, you know, they're scared by Leo's jump scare, you know, they're like, oh, Leo, where'd you come from? But Bobby sees a man in the woods behind Leo. He's like, who's with you? And the man that's in the woods behind Leo just kind of like ducks behind a tree. It's like really creepy. And Leo's just like, don't worry about it. I need my money. You punks owe me 10 grand. Well, Bobby explains that Laura had the money in her safety deposit box, so they're gonna need a little more time to get that money to him. Laura was a wild girl. Tell me about it. Leo's like, well, I got problems. I got lots of problems. My wife is stepping out. You find out your old lady's been giving it away. Bobby's like, oh, you don't say. Uh, with who? Leo doesn't answer. So do you know who? Bobby is shaking in his boots. I mean, he keeps asking, do you know who? Do you know who? Who is it? And Leo the whole time is just giving him like non-answers. Then uh, Leo says something very intimidating. You know, he like cocks his gun and is like, go out for, for a, a pass. pass. 
I didn't know what this meant. I had to ask my boyfriend what going out for a pass means, but apparently it means catching a football. So Bobby's like, what? And then he like, you know, points that gun at him. So he starts going out for that pass. Mike and Bobby book it out of the woods. They get in their car, get out of there. Leo is very scary. <laughs> Ed enters his house covered in grease and he accidentally steps on Nadine's drape runner invention, breaking it. Well, Nadine is so mad about this. She's doing some kind of like exercise equipment. I don't know what this machine is, but she's so mad. She's like, and bends the metal. <laughs> she bends the metal with her own two hands and her strength. Cooper, Lucy, Andy, Hawk, and Harry are outside the sheriff's department. Cooper has brought the chalkboard out there and he has the gang measuring out exactly 60 feet 6 inches. What do you think he's up to? Cooper is putting some sort of strange experiment together. He's got a bucket full of rocks, a glass milk bottle sitting on a stump, and his chalkboard. Everybody sits down and he is ready to give his lecture. So he's talking about the Tibetans and the Dalai Lama. Cooper says, following a dream he had three years ago, he has become deeply moved by the plight of the Tibetan people, and he's filled with the desire to help them. He also says, and I quote, I also awoke from the same dream realizing that I had subconsciously gained knowledge of a deductive technique involving mind-body coordination operating hand-in-hand -hand with the deepest level of intuition. What do you think he's up to? So, something about this dream he had has caused him to have this sort of intuition. So basically, the exercise here is Cooper is standing next to the bucket of rocks while Lucy has the chalkboard with a list of J names. Because if you remember, the last diary entry Laura had written said, nervous about meeting J tonight. Cooper wants to determine who this J name was through this exercise. So what he will be doing is throwing a rock at a glass bottle that is exactly 60 feet and 6 inches away sitting on a stump. Now, if the rock misses the bottle, you don't do anything to the name, Lucy. So there's no check next to either of these names? That's correct. But if the rock hits the bottle, then Lucy will make a little mark by that name. Make a check to the right of that name. And if the rock breaks the bottle, then she'll make another mark. Also, um, Harry is supposed to read out the name and the relationship to Laura Palmer before he throws the rock. Briefly state that person's relationship to Laura Palmer. So it's a whole convoluted process, but basically what we are led to believe is the closer that rock comes to hitting the glass bottle, the more suspicious the name of the person is. So we get some good physical humor here of either the rock really missing the bottle, oh. or hitting Andy. Where there's no sense, there's no feeling, Andy. Harry reads the name Jacoby, and the rock hits the bottle, knocks it over. Make a note that the bottle was struck, but did not break. Very important. So they reset the bottle to the exact position. Do the exercise some more. James Hurley. And finally, whenever Harry reads the name, Leo Johnson. Leo Johnson. Connection with Laura, unknown. Cooper throws that rock, shatters the bottle. So Shelly is alone in her house. On the TV is Invitation to Love, a recurring soap opera that we see in this show. So then, Invitation to Love. Shelly does not want to hear about love right now, so she turns that right off. Right. Here's a knock at the door. 
it's Bobby. She's furious. She's like, how could, how could you do this? Showing up unannounced, Bobby. You're gonna get me killed. You're gonna be killed. Bobby's like, whoa, whoa. What's wrong with your face? Shelly has a big old bruise on her face. She's like, Leo Johnson, that's what happened to me. I'll kill him. Audrey is at the Double R Diner. She waltzes in all cool, puts her jazz song on the jukebox. This is Audrey's favorite song. Favorite song to get down to. When this song comes on, she's like, that's my song. <laughs> Well, we see that Donna and her parents are there, too. Donna's like, I'm gonna go say hi. Goes and sits next to Audrey. Hi, Donna. Audrey starts talking about Agent Cooper. She's like, Cooper likes his coffee black. So now Audrey drinks her coffee black. They giggle. Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> then Audrey asks Donna something odd. She asks if... Laura ever talked about her dad? Did Laura ever talk about my father? Donna's like, why would you ask that? She's like, well, he used to sing to her. He used to sing to her. Audrey gets up and starts dancing to her song in the middle of the double R. Everyone looks at her. I'm like, poor girl, she is just starving for attention. Cooper and Harry are at the sheriff's station investigating a bloody rag they found at the crime scene. All right. Here we meet Albert, a forensic genius who lacks social niceties. Yeah, I can hear perfectly well, Curly. Immediately, he rubs Harry the wrong way. And pretty much everybody in the town Twin Peaks because he doesn't really like small towns. I have seen some slipshod backwater bergs, but this place takes the cake. Harry pulls him aside and gives him a stern talking to. And he comes home to a very elated Nadine. <coughs> because earlier when he had come in and crushed her invention, he had dripped grease on her cotton balls. And instead of throwing them away, she put those cotton balls on her runners and now complete silence whenever you open and close the curtains. She's like, oh, Ed, we're gonna be so rich. We're gonna be so rich. Catherine is complaining to her husband, Pete, as she's getting ready for bed. Everything smells like fish around here. You know, she's asking questions about the FBI agent that was over here earlier. While Catherine is in the bathroom, Pete, sneaks Josie a key. So Josie takes that key and opens a secret safe that's kind of like hidden behind a bookshelf. And inside the safe, she finds two books that look exactly the same. Back at the Palmer's house, Leland puts on a record and starts crying to a picture of Laura. He picks up the picture and starts spinning around with it and crying. <laughs> Sarah comes in, sees this scene. Leland's like, we have to dance for Laura. And Sarah is like, what is going on in this house? What is going on in this house? And you know, she tries to stop Leland from dancing, but they fall and the picture frame shatters and cuts Sarah's hand. And so now the picture is covered in blood and Leland is just crying and putting his face to the picture of Laura. Cooper goes to bed at the Great Northern and it's dream time. We enter a dream sequence where Cooper is an old man sitting in a room filled with red curtains. And we see the familiar one-armed man reciting a poem. Through the darkness of future's past, the magician longs to see. One chance out between two worlds, fire, walk with me. So the one-armed man says that they lived among the people in a place we call the convenience store. They lived above it. I mean it like it is, like it sounds. 
He says he was touched by the devilish one, the one with the tattoo on the left shoulder. But then he saw the face of God and he took the entire arm off. I took the entire arm off. He says his name is Mike, so that's why he's one-armed Mike. He's like, my name is Mike, his name is Bob. And we see Bob is the long-haired creepy guy that Sarah had seen in her house earlier. Bob snarls and he says that he will kill again. Catch you with my death bag. You may think I've gone insane, but I promise I will kill again. We see that there is a little man in the room who's like shivering. He sits on a couch across from old Cooper and Laura Palmer is next to him. The little man is like, this is my cousin. She's my cousin. Cooper's like, Laura Palmer? But it, it is Laura Palmer. And Laura's like, I think I know her, but sometimes my arms spin back. My arms spin back. Laura gets up, walks over to Coop, and gives him a smooch. Then she whispers in his ear something we cannot hear. Well, Cooper wakes up from this dream, and the first thing he does is call Harry. He says, I know who killed Laura Palmer. They agree to meet in the morning to discuss. And that's the end of episode three. Things are getting good, you guys! Getting real good! I freaking love it! My blue rose and thorn for the episode. Mmm, really hard to pick. This episode is so good, but I really, I love these moments that we have in Cooper's dreams, so my blue rose will have to be this entire dream sequence. It is just so surreal, and you know, it's at this point in the show where it just changes from a murder mystery to something a little more sinister, a little more horrific. What's going on? My thorn for the episode is Albert being mean to Harry. I don't like to see Harry get offended. Welcome to Amateur Hour. Once again, thank you to my Patreon supporters. Mwah, mwah. If you feel like supporting me, you should check me out there, you guys. Kim Carter Cameron, signing out.